Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined by my fantastic co-host. He can't get over how Rakdos Lord of Riots doesn't have the riot keyword. It's Dana Roach. Um, I was out for New Year's and this guy walked into the bar um, and that was the end of the limbo contest for him. He was immediately disqualified. <laughs> I was like, I I recognize the setup to a walked into a <laughs> bar joke. I've I've been to grade school, Dana. I think we got to step it up here. Come on. <laughs> and it wasn't that many years ago. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Shots fired. <laughs> Happy New Year to you too. <laughs> it's a compliment that you look young. I guess so. I guess, do I look young? Anyway. When you're my uh, age, it's a compliment. <laughs> Uh, all right, Dana, it's the two of us on this episode. Matt is uh, taking this episode off because mm. you and I embarked upon a very interesting project the past year, and we're so excited to have it as an episode finally. What are we talking about, dude? Uh, we logged all our games for one year, and we're going to talk about some of those stats. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm excited. I've seriously been looking forward to this for so long. It's currently January 3rd when we're recording this episode. Yes. Uh, I know it'll come out a little bit later in, in January when we finally do get it published. But like, yeah, we recorded all our games for a year. What were our winningest decks? What were the decks that we played against the most? What was our average win percentage? How long did games go? How What, what was the effect on things like fast mana and how they affect a game? There's a whole bunch of data for us to get into. But I got to calm down because we've got some shout outs to do before we get into this main topic. First, I'd like to thank Chase, also known as Mana Curves, for helping editing the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And if you'd like to support the show, you can, of course, like and subscribe. Give us a review on your favorite podcatching platform. And, of course, you can head over to patreon.com slash edhretcast. We've got a ton of amazing different tiers there if you want to be part of the Discord community, where folks have been playing a whole bunch of games, and we're getting in some games with our listeners there, too. And we've got a couple of other awesome options there as well. There are so many fun things that you can do to support EDH Rec. And again, seriously, even just liking and subscribing, leaving us a review, leaving us a comment, that is also a perfectly cool uh, free way to support us as well well and we super appreciate all of it and of course we've got our epic patreon shout out that we want to do dana who's this episode dedicated to this week we'll be shouting out william tonyes um minneapolis resident someone i've actually gotten to play with at a couple different events so um i it, because i know you and have met you i'm not going to make a make a some kind of a mat joke about your last name i'm just going to say Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we appreciate it. I, I, I'm so happy that, <laughs> Dana, I'm really happy that you clarified that you know who this person is, and not that you just, I know where you lived, one of our <laughs> patrons, because <Yeah. laughs> it almost <laughs> sounded like that. For We're going to dox you. That's what's going to happen here. Please no. <laughs> Starting off the new year with a threat. <laughs> no, the only dox in magic that's appropriate is dox side extortionist. There we hey, go. there's the dumb dad joke. That's barely appropriate. Good point, actually. Yeah, very, very good point. I'm just trying to uh, uh, channel the Matt dad joke energy. There we here. go. Well, well, Bill, thanks for supporting the show regardless. And thanks to all our patron supporters. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Yeah, seriously. Thank you all so much. Okay, Dana, let's get yes. into it. We are talking about all of the, the, the games that we tracked. First, let's just get some raw numbers. How many games did you play over the course of the last year, 2023? Um, I played um, 338 games. That's a lot. And that was <laughs> that down is more than a me. little bit from 2022. So I, I, I took it easy. <laughs> so not quite on the rate of one game per day, yeah. but you were getting close to it. Uh, and, and that is more than me. I managed to get 217 games in last year. Um, pretty pretty good amount. I, I'm pretty feeling good. pretty good about those. Yeah, yeah. And I was, and I I was, was happy The main that. difference is probably because I, I have a, a weekly LGS game night I go to and play pretty much every mm. week and i had about 100 more games than you and over the course of you know 52 weeks a year playing a couple of games on that lgs night is, that's probably what the main difference was between you and i because we mostly went to the same events that kind of thing mm. so yeah that that's what put me way over the top yeah and certainly some of the games that i played were against like my family meta mm. like over the holidays i got to play a bunch of so like i think that my games kind of go like a dry spell and then a whole bunch and then a dry spell and then a whole bunch like <laughs> i kind of have like a, more of the the hair and you're more of the tortoise you've got that slow and there steady winning yes. that race um so that was the number of games played but i think the first thing for us to start off with was actually just our overall win percentage and we'll get to some individual deck win percentages later but like of those 300 plus games that you played what was your winningness streak like what what did it look like in terms of uh how many games you won uh i won 41 percent of of the games i played 
Um, and I, I didn't break mm. down how many were like three player versus four player games, but mm. I, yeah. top of my head, 96% of them, 97% of them were four player games. There's a couple threes in there, but not very many. Okay. So Dana, that's a lot. Uh, I just want to say 41%. Yes. That's big. I, I think that's a thing that we might need to unpack a little bit. Um, m- my overall win percentage of the 217 games that I played, I lost 144 of them, which means I won 73 of them, AKA my overall win percentage was 33.6%. Um, so if we're assuming that the average expected win rate in a four player game is going to be that 25%, we're certainly both over that mark. Um, I feel like, Oh, okay. You know, 33%. I feel pretty, pretty good with that. And also not worried that like, oh, I crushed some people or whatever, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, so like hearing yours is at 41, I'm not going to lie. Uh, if I had a, a win percentage that was like approaching 50%, for example, I'd be like, ooh, okay, am I punching too hard? Uh, so maybe let's talk about like that, I sure, guess. Sure, like how certainly. do you feel about your number? Uh, yeah, so, so this is a thing I've been thinking about a lot this year, not even in relationship to this, just in relationship to like rule zero conversations and mm. that kind of stuff. And, and when we've talked, um, you know, including Matt over the course of the last several years, we've done things like take tutors out of our decks, right. uh, maybe stop running a few things like Cyclonic Rift or, you know, Rhystic Studies not going in, in every deck, although it's one of those cards that like, every deck's probably better running it. Mm. Um, so, so we've maybe destapled our decks a little bit and, and powered them down in that regard. Um, so thinking about this and, and various rule zero conversations, uh, one of the things that uh, I've kind of come to the conclusion about regarding power level of decks, um, I, I think there's kind of two different kinds of power you can, you can, ascribed to a deck. Uh, in, in myself, I, I call those hard power and soft power. Hmm. Um, hard power are the things that are just strictly strong in almost any circumstance. Uh, a deck is probably better with a demonic tutor. Um, a deck is probably better with a mana crypt. Fast mana tutors, bombs like a rhystic study, like we mentioned, is just a great card in every deck. You know, a two card combo that just wins the game. Something like Thassa's Oracle, whatever demonic consultation or whatever you use to get into that combo. Those are things that are just what I call hard power. Um, And those are the things I tend to not run in my decks. Um, But (laughs) I think there's something that I've been referring to as soft power. And I think that's kind of the power between the power, maybe is how I would describe it. Hmm. Um, like the little things in your deck that aren't readily apparent to somebody. You know, you're playing winged words in a deck that has a flying commander, and your opponent, who also has a flying commander, is playing divination. Um, so, like, you are saving a mana very regularly over your opponent, who is not, because divination is just always going to cost three to draw two. I'm regularly going to pay two to draw those same two cards. I have a lot of soft power, I think, in my decks, and I think that is the pri- one of the primary differences in why I win games. Um, I-, I think pub stomping is a result almost always of hard power, hmm. and I think soft power is just a thing that happens when you play 331 games a year and then <laughs> record another you know, 50-some hours of podcasting and write articles and do all of those things. It's kind of that the Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell thing, where if you put ten thousand hours into a thing, sure, yeah, 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 and, and that kind of has been debunked a little bit. But like, the, anyone who's ever played pool against a friend whose parents had a pool table, <laughs> okay, can I, I, tell you there's a difference. And like, I, I I feel relatively comfortable given the lack of hard power in most of my decks that I can chalk a lot of the difference that that the difference between winning a quarter of your games in a four player plot and winning, you know, 40% of them, I think I I'm ch- I'm going to chalk most of that up I think to both soft power and just the fact that I just do this a lot more than most people. I I I do feel what you're I I think I'm picking up what you're putting down uh particularly here the thing that is of interest to me is that like like, yeah, 41% is high. And I think that I myself might have some discomfort with that if it was my number. But sure. also at the same time, if you were below 
um if if you were your win percentage was like eight percent or something and be like dana you you're on a, an edh podcast what you doing sure. <laughs> like, absolutely sure but i also want to clarify that in saying that i don't want to make it sound like if someone else out there does measure their games and they come away with a a, a number below 25 percent, that's also not a problem and that doesn't reflect upon you as a person or as a player because especially early on when i was uh tracking my games i got like 80 games in or whatever um and i was just like huh i've won like 15 percent of my game so far and then it had a major swing up by the end of the year uh like it, it really does take a lot and i mean a lot a lot of games a huge sample size for any of those numbers to not wildly rapidly swing yeah. one thing to a completely different number and so it really becomes a thing about like you this should be something that you measure growth over time as opposed to measuring like just a, a smaller sample size or anything like that and losing games is also super cool if the games were fun Absolutely. so like the win percentage numbers are an interesting thing for us to look at but ultimately i also kind of don't care about them because what i care about is whether i had fun playing against you whether i had fun playing my own deck that kind of deal so th that's harder to quantify but we got some raw numbers here and it's just an interesting thing for us to start off and yeah. and how we feel about it but yeah yeah um and and i've walked away like i didn't measure game speed either um and i'm actually going to track that next year i'm probably going to wind up using your spreadsheet joey that a uh, I, I believe might be publicly available um we haven't figured out the mechanism for that yet but soon yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that that was one thing um yeah measuring game length was I gotta admit, it was it, it was a process. Uh, it, it was a lot, um, and and we'll certainly get into those numbers. But first, we'll stay a little bit more personal because um, yep. we were just talking about win percentage, how many games we played. Uh, let's establish the decks that we played, though, before we get sure. to any of the other stuff. Like, what was the effect of did the first player going first win a lot more, or how long were games and fast mana? Did that make any difference? Let's actually start off with a couple of more individual statistics. Uh, which decks did you play the most this year, Dana? Um, so the decks I played the most, um, the, 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 the top two were Itch Techic, um, Salvage Splicer and Malcolm and, which is a partner pair. And then Jahira, um, and Agent of the Iron Throne, which is a commander with a background. Mm. Um, and I wound up playing Itch Techic, um, about 30, it was like 36 times when I played Jahira, Agent of the Iron Throne, 32 times. So in the 30 ish range for, for both of those decks. And I would wager the reason those saw the most play was because I built them both towards the end of 2022. So uh, I had a full year to play them. Some of my other decks I played a lot. I probably next year probably will be higher because it's a new deck. You want to play it more, but I didn't have them for a full year. I was just going to say, yeah, that new deck energy. So those two had new deck energy and a full 365 days worth of uh, of time to actually play them. So. I'm fairly certain those are decks that were built, you know, October, November ish of, of 2022. Totally not surprised that I played them the most. And after those top two that had more than 30 plays, we're looking at um, Glissa Sunslayer that was originally Glissa the Traitor. And I changed the commander out right after it came out and made a few small changes to the deck. But it, I wanted to get some reps with that because the deck changed. So that had 26 games. Um, Dromoko the Eternal, also a relatively new deck, had 26 reps. And Agnes the Dragon's Lash, a brand new deck. Um, John Commander, but I built it mono red. That had 26 games as well. So it was almost all rounding out the top five commanders that were just decks that were new that I just wanted to get reps in with. So those were the, the five I played the most often. What were your, your most frequently played decks last year? Uh, <laughs> predictably, my top played commander was Baba La Saga, uh, my absolute darling. I love her. Uh, I played 35 games with her. Um, the next most popular one was my commander commander deck with Tana and Timna, uh, which surprised me that that one became one of my most played. I played 27 games with it. Um, and that is the deck where, I, honestly, like I played it the most at events, like whenever I would start explaining, and you know, here's my deck where every card in the deck has to say the word commander on it people are like i gotta see that <laughs> like it kind of had that energy to it so i was surprised how much i played it but it was a, a really enjoyable time um a silly theme but the deck do slap um and then my next most played and this one also surprised me was my barakos and folk hero deck which i played 21 games with uh i am shocked at how much i've fallen in love with this deck but i really just have fallen hard for it because it has a little bit of that same babala saga style to it where every single turn feels like a puzzle i'm trying to balance out how do i get the appropriate types to trigger Babala Saga to trigger the party mechanic on Barakos. And so the fact that not just every game feels different
different, but also every single turn feels super different, really drove me to play a whole lot of those. And I had so much fun playing them this year. So those were my top three. Uh, of those top three, which had the best win percentage? Uh, so now we're getting into some win percentage things, are we? Uh, I, I'm just, I'm kind of curious to see like how much, if, if there was any correlation between uh, uh, the, the popularity of a deck and how often you grabbed it and how often it won. Um, of those specific three, interestingly, uh, Barakos actually had the highest win percentage. It won 38% of the 21 games that it played. Um, but the other two were not far behind. Babala Saga won 34% of its games, and Tana and Timna won a clean third of the games that it played. Uh, so 33% win condition. So all of them uh, sitting above that average. I do think that like there's probably a correlation to, yeah, I played these a lot, so I got a lot of reps in with them. Sure. I will say, though, they're certainly not my winningest decks of the year uh, by... Okay, all right. Uh, not by a long shot but we'll get to that in a minute because those are the decks that we played the most what decks didn't you play this year Th that is a real thing like for me honestly one of the reasons that i wanted to do this episode uh to do this data tracking is to be like all right which decks have i not actually touched and is that a sign that i should take them apart potentially uh so like yeah so, so i have one deck that i own that i played zero times last year um hmm. and, and that's edrix by master of trust um sure but i think that's that's not new. I don't know if I played it in 2022 or 2021 or even 2020. I believe the last time that deck actually <laughs> saw an actual game of Commander was at a Vegas event, I want to say 2019. Um, mm. So it, it, it's a deck that I only really play if I'm playing, like, if people want to play something CEDH-ish. And it's not a CEDH deck, but it's the one that probably would embarrass me the least at a CEDH table. Um, and because huh. I just don't play at that power level, I don't play the deck. So I keep it around and I keep it updated just in case I ever need to use it. But I clearly haven't needed to use it for the last four years. <laughs> oh, yeah. So is there a reason that you still have it then? Is it really just a just in case kind of just, button? It's just or in like... case and like the cards aren't being into. I have no other decks that are demanding a copy of Scrib Sprites or anything like that. <laughs> the way that deck is kind of built, okay. nothing else really wants any of those cards. So it's, it doesn't really feel bad having it set there unused for years at a time. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll to reflect on my uh, decks that are the least played played. I have a deck that is not the most least played, but I didn't play it a whole lot, and that is my Titania deck. Um, I played only three games with her uh, this year, and Dana, it is actually for very similar reasons to your Edric story, and that's why I'm going to bring it up first here, because um, Titania actually is my winningest deck of the year. The, the sample size is so teensy. Three games is only three games. That is the teensiest of teensy, but it didn't lose a single one of them. Titania has a 100% undefeated win percentage here, which feels pretty cool. But it's also a thing that I knew about that deck sure, already. Sure. I'm like, I'm pretty confident that this is my probably my strongest deck. It, it isn't the one that feels like it's doing the grossest stuff. That's probably Conrad. But Titania has fully been able to end a game on like turn six just with the number of land ridiculous elemental stuff that you can do mm -hmm. but that is like i'm aware of the fact that i should only bring titania out when people are like okay let's go you know pedal to the metal sure. um, so that's why i didn't play her very often but i'm not inclined to take her apart anytime soon whereas the other three decks that i didn't play the most this year they are ones i am taking apart um and they're for a couple of different reasons uh my elegath deck elegath and essior that's my my wonderful blue scry sphinx i was so excited to build it i played one game of it last year just one and it, it was also uh like an 11 turn game and that's just that's another reason why i was like yeah i'm not bringing this to events because the games go long and i can't risk a two-hour game when i gotta go get lunch or go to an event or something like that um i also played exactly one game with a tyvar the bellicose deck and i did a video about that on this channel about how like i played one game with it and then I was bored immediately. <laughs> I felt like I had experienced everything that there was to experience with that commander, which really bummed me out. Um, and then I also had an old Rutstein uh, deck, which was full of like all Mortivore and Lurgoyf type of things. So creatures that got bigger equal to the size of your graveyard. I played four games with that one, but it just, it didn't, it, over time, it really didn't excite me. And I didn't find myself uh, reaching for it again and again. So those were the ones that I played the least. And old Rutstein, Tyvar, and Elegith are all decks that I'm either taking apart or we're only going to be uh, preserving them for like, oh, a new player. Uh, let's see if these are something that'll help them ease into the format for a, a first early game or something like that. So they're ones that I'm just like, yeah, if I'm not playing them, then why do I have them? Uh, so those are the reasons that I did not play those decks a whole lot over 2023. 
Yeah, I had a couple, aside from my deck that didn't see any play, that saw very little play. Um, my Reki History Kamigawa deck saw seven games over the course of the year. Um, similar to Titania, it, it had a pretty good one percentage at one five of the seven. I played it. Ooh. Um, and I think one of those losses, you were even in the game in, um, I think Salt Lake City. And I did the amount of things that would normally win you a game too. So I, like that could have very easily turned the corner into six or seven games. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a deck that I don't break out very often. It's just one that sometimes folks request, even though it might not necessarily be, um, an even power match. Um, I, my Athros got a passage deck, saw three games and, um, uh, and Jira with eyes open, um, Jiro saw seven games, Athreo saw three, and the reason for those decks is they tend to also play a little bit slowly. Yeah, I was going to say it's the Elegeth problem, right? Yeah, but I enjoy those decks a lot, so I like, I, I've kept them, but I just only play them if I'm, if, you know, friends get together some night, and I, I know they're not going to be annoyed at that Jiro deck if I've got six Planeswalkers out that I'm making tokens with, or my Athreos deck is a pest once deck, and I kind of have everyone unable to play creatures for a couple turns as I burn them down with, you know, eight pest once damage a turn. So um, th those are decks where I just am, am playing for a select crowd, although I am keeping them around. Mm -hmm. I did, however, have a couple that won't make the cut or or, or or that I put together that didn't last long. Arwen Mortal Queen only made it a few games. Um, I had built a Radiant and Jessica deck that I played twice, three, excuse me, three times and took apart. Um, I tried to turn my Selesny Enchantress deck into a mono green Thrun the Last Troll deck that made it four games. So th there were uh, a, a couple experiments that that didn't last more than basically one night's worth of games. Yeah, that, and I think a lot of that tracks with the, the similar experience to me. And I hope that that's something that, you know, listeners maybe get to take away as well is that like once you feel like, oh, I've done everything that there is to do with this deck. Right. Like yes. that can potentially cause you to take that deck apart. So that's a thing to consider before you commit to building one. Mm -hmm. And of course, the game length, like even though I really enjoy what my Sphinx guy was doing, the fact that the games took forever, it was like I if I'm going to actually take a real stab at this, I got to find a way for it to have a little bit more alacrity and in a way that doesn't bore me while I'm playing right. it. Um, um, and that led to, you know, you were like, oh, these decks have some long games, so I got to solve for that. Or, as you said, only bring it out in very specific scenarios. So, uh, yeah, and, and and that tracks. And that is also kind of the case with one of my other winningest decks of the year, as long as we're talking about, um, you know, some of the, the higher numbers. You know, I mentioned Titania. I didn't lose a game. I only played three of them. And then you mentioned your Reki, and Reki has similar numbers to me with my Mimeoplasm deck, which I also only pull out in very selective uh, situations because I played it six times and won four of those games. So 66 win percentage on that. That was my next highest winning uh, deck of the year. I guess like with technically an okay sample size because like I, I won the game that I played with Tyvar and like technically, okay, he's undefeated, but then I took the deck apart. So like that doesn't really count. <laughs> doesn't sure, really count. Right. And, and even Titania's three games. Do you call that a full? I don't know. I don't know if you'd call that a full sample size. Maybe Plasm had six, uh, so you know that's good. Um, my Vohar deck also was a big shock to me. I played eleven games with that. That is my Vohar uh, Reanimator. I just use it as a Merfolk looter in the command zone, and then I just resurrect really huge eight drops into play. Uh, of the eleven games that I played, I won forty-five percent of those, and that one did surprise me because I didn't think that the deck was actually that good. But it turns out Reanimator is amazing. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. And then here was a funny statistic for me as well. I played seven games with decks that I borrowed, and I won four of them. So that I won 57% of the games that I played with not my deck. Uh, and that's kind of a fun thing to have found out. It's like, oh, okay. Turns out when people hand me a pile of cards, maybe I'll be okay at it. Right, yes. Which which kind of goes to back up that that soft part of the soft, soft power thing a little bit. When it's like, you can win even with someone else's deck. I think it shows there's a lot of intangibles that add to one's win percentage for sure. And, and throughout, like if folks are, are watching the YouTube version of this, we'll probably have like these graphs on screen if you want to see the yeah. full breakdown. We've got a lot of decks, so we can't probably list out every single number. Most of my decks fell within the like, you know, 28 to 30 plus percent range in average with what my win percentage was for the year. But Dana, that does force us to talk now about our decks that sucked. Um, <laughs> that's a silly way to say it. Our decks that lost the greatest number of times this year. I'll start off with my losingest deck of the year. Um, I didn't win any games with my Rutstein or Elegith, but the sample size on them, as I said, was so small. I don't know if we want to count it. Like one game with Elegith and I lost it. I, okay. 
technically it's only defeated, but like the sample size, eh, it's weird. Uh, whereas decks that I feel like I had a pretty comfortable sample size with, my Virtus deck, Life Chopper, only won one of the eight games that I played with that, so 12% win percentage on that guy. Karazakar had an 18% win percentage off of 11 games. And then my Will Help deck, I played 18 times this year, which was uh, really great, but the win percentage was slightly below average at 22. So those were my three losingest decks of the year, I guess you could say. I didn't have anything that, that broke um, that was under 25%. <laughs> well, um, bully for you <laughs> then, Dana. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Glissa Herald of Predation, which was the the fourth Glissa deck, the one that makes the Incubate tokens. Twelve games, I won four of them. And my Silum Guard, the Drifting Death deck, so so that would be um, Demir Dragons, twenty nine percent. So I played that twenty one games. I think that's a pretty decent sample size, all things considered. Ooh, yeah. In, in that one twenty nine. So so those were the ones that performed the least, but they were also really fun games to play. I like I enjoy both those decks a lot, so I'm perfectly content with those win percentages. And th those are also decks, I think it's it's worth noting, those decks won't get a lot of toys. The amount of things that care about Incubate Tokens, I, I'm just not going to get very much. And because of how Incubate Tokens work, right. things that like even do populate won't, won't really work because those those creatures are zero zeros and they're only good because of the counters that come on them from Incubate. So like that Glissa deck is probably not going to change a whole heck of a lot. And we just tend to not get black and blue dragons very much for Silvgar. So sure, yeah. um, I, I don't see those decks changing a whole lot in, in the, the near future. Yeah. And to kind of go back to something that we said earlier, like, oh no, my Viridus deck only won one of the eight games that it played. It was a 12.5% win percentage on that one. I don't care. I love that deck. <laughs> like, Sure. Yeah. I, I think that there are some conclusions I can kind of draw from those. Um, like, you know, when it turns out that your commander is a little dude who pokes someone and cuts their life in half, people don't like that and they attack you more. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, or Karazakar having an 18% win percentage there. Like, yeah, when I goad everyone's stuff and I'm trying to make sure that people have a lot of creatures in play and then goad doesn't do a whole lot when it goes down to one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not surprised to see that those things were near the, you know, at the bottom of that barrel. Um, but I don't, I, I don't care because I love playing them so much. So like their win percentage doesn't really matter to me so much as like, did I enjoy playing them? And I absolutely did. But it is also a thing for me to take as a lesson for any of the decks where I'm just like, okay, I want to spice this up. The fear that something as innocuous as Virtus will put into people, maybe it's not innocuous after all. Or like, here are some negative side effects of a deck that cares a lot about Goad, um, and what is its long game and stuff like that. So those are you know, lessons to, to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because the, those two particular decks, you're talking about decks where the, the commander's telling you, for the most part, what your win condition is going to be. It's telling your opponents, I should say. Mm -hmm. And it's there on the commander and kind of requires the commander to function for that win condition to occur. Right. Um, so, like, people know what's going to happen, and they can see how to keep that from happening. Um, versus the two of the decks that I, that I played the most this year, and, and both had which pretty good win percentages. I mentioned Jahira and um, Ichtekik. That's significantly less obvious yes itch Tekic says he's going to be making golems um but having played but against that deck i'm shocked how many golems you manage to make <laughs> yeah well you make a lot of golems and then most people aren't like it, there's the also the text on the card where when an artifact goes to the graveyard you put a plus one counter on those golems um and a lot of times folks aren't prepared for the you know golems that come swinging in and all of a sudden you crack three or four treasures and sacrifice a mind stone and those golems go from being three threes to like nine nines and that isn't, I don't think, as readily apparent to the to someone who hasn't seen the deck before as as might be something like Karazakar. Um, similarly, for that Jahira deck, it's it's built around sacrificing Eldrazi spawns and scions. And again, I don't think that's readily apparent to most people when they're playing the deck. And I'm I'm doing things and, and making, hey, there's a ton of Eldrazi spawns and scions in play, and and all of a sudden, then Age of Iron Throne hits, and I'll drop something else. Like me took massacre and everyone takes thirty damage when I sacrifice those spawns and scions. I, I think it's it, it. I think folks who haven't seen the deck before don't necessarily know how to respond to those decks as easily as the couple ones you had, Joey, that like had lower win percentages. That definitely makes a difference. 
There's also something to be said. You said that one of your uh, losingest decks was that uh, Glissa the Herald. Mm -hmm. and, and granted, your version of losingest deck was still at the regular expected 25% win. Con sure. Congratulations for you. But like compared to a lot of your other decks, that's the one where it's just like, all right, how the heck am I going to tinker this to actually put something together? Because like right. compared to a lot of the other strategies, that one, I suppose, needs the most support. And so that's another lesson, I think, to keep in mind for you know a deck's win percentage is not just like the unexpectedness of some of those strategies and like how much those commanders are telegraphing here's precisely what the strategy is it's all on board but like also your own ability to have support for that deck and like whether those yeah. things exist in the game also significantly matters a lot too mm -hmm. so those are good lessons for us to both take away i think from seeing what the numbers were on those decks down at the bottom of our lists uh, were there any decks that were a surprise for you that performed better than you thought they were going to perform or you were just general surprised at the performance well what surprised me most is that you haven't segued into challenge the stats yet if i'm being perfectly honest um, <laughs> but i guess you matt did say that you need to find a new shtick for the yeah, year yeah, so. new, yeah, yeah new year new bed so we'll, we'll yeah we'll go back to the old timey days so challenge the stats old timey why me uh so yeah we I'll, I'll answer your question and get into some other very specific data here because i do want to talk about things like you know the effect that did fast mana have on the games or first player did that affect win percentage and, and things like that and we've got a, a bit of extra information to go into but first dana there's so much data on edh rec but we don't always agree with it so we gotta challenge those stats after this quick break this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. What are some things you want to keep the same about yourself or your life in 2024? In the new year, we tend to obsess over things that we want to change about ourselves, but it's good to pause and ask, where are you already crushing it? Think the opposite of new year, new you. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. I think therapy is so important to help you set boundaries and to help put abstract feelings into words. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try, where you can get matched with a licensed therapist in no time. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient. And I love something that's so easy to fit into your schedule, because with so few obstacles in your way, that means it's harder to make excuses and not to do something that's good for you, you know? Removing extra steps that got in the way of my wellness goals was one of those brain hacks I did on myself last year to help me stay on track. So that flexibility, I just think it's aces. And talking with a the therapist is one of those things that reminded me not just to focus on change, but to be proud of those wellness goals that I accomplished last year. So celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash EDH today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, hel pcom slash EDH. Okie doke, I'm going to get us started with Challenge the Stats this week, and I have a card that I think needs to show up a little bit more in some new pirate decks. Admiral Brass Unsinkable is a new Grixis human pirate, a 5-mana 3-3, three, three, and she does some really fun reanimator stuff, so you know that I like it. Um, when she enters the battlefield, you mill four cards, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you can return a pirate creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it, and then that pirate gains haste, but its uh, power and toughness is reset to a 4-4 from Admiral Brass's ability. Finality counters are a really interesting little thing that we see where a, if a creature with a finality counter on it would die, instead you exile it. And so, you know, you'll get your pirates back, but you can't get them back over and, and over and over and over again. Um, they have one more time to shine, basically. Um, but that is a, a characteristic specifically of the finality counter, which means I think that the card Nesting Grounds, which only shows up in 22% of Admiral Brass decks so far, needs to show up in a couple more of those decks. Um, Nesting Grounds is a colorless land. It uh, also has this very, very silly ability to pay one, tap, and then you can move a counter from target permanent that you control onto another target permanent. And this can only be activated as a sorcery. So you can move one of those finality counters from your pirate off onto someone else's thing instead. And then um, that finality ability is going to follow that counter if their thing dies instead it gets exiled. And then you can keep reviving the same pirate over and over again in case it ends up dying. Um, yeah, only 22% of the 2000 Admiral Brass Unsinkable decks are playing this little land. It's kind of innocuous, but it's also kind of annoying. And I feel like more folks would make really excellent use of this. So give this one a shot if you're uh, going to plunder the Yar me mateys. I don't know. I'm trying to channel Matt again and it's not working. But yeah, check this one out for pirates. I, I, I think that's a good challenge, Joey, but I've just spent the last like three minutes just hearing the theme song to the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And I just keep hearing... Break it fast. <laughs> Unbreakable. 
So well, that's had me distracted. Uh, it's it's interesting that you go there and not to like Pirates of the Caribbean or anything like that. But okay. Yeah. And they, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. My challenge this week was brought to us by the listener, My Life as John C. Um, and it is the card Liquid Metal Torque being underplayed in Freylace Lenoir's Fury decks. <laughs> um, Liquid Metal Torque's a great card, and we've talked about it plenty on this show, including just, uh, I believe, last week's episode where we where we uh, went over a bunch of Mana Rocks. Yeah. Um, but it does tend to see way less play in mono green decks because players in green like to do their ramp via land ramp. Liquid Metal Torque in Freylace, however, has a ton of synergy, um, particularly because the commander has a minus two ability that says destroy target artifact or enchantment. And because Liquid Metal Torque can be tapped to turn a non-land permanent into an artifact, basically you have the ability to use your commander to destroy anything for the most part that your opponents have in play. Yeah. Um, right now, only about 27 of the 1,400 decks in EDH Rec are running Liquid Metal Torque, and... A, a card that just lets you use your commander to blow up anything, plus it's a ramp spell, that seems really, really good and should definitely see more play in Frail Ice decks. This, so, fun fact, everyone. Uh, <laughs> My Life is John C. Totally co-signing on this, obviously, if it wasn't already like clear. I, I, I love this. Um, but a fun fact was that apparently... Uh, one of my challenges on an early episode, uh, episode 24, I challenged Liquid Metal Coating for yes. Frail East X yeah. for the same reason, and Liquid Metal Torque is definitely an upgrade. So, yeah, definitely both of those should see play. If your commander can just, just straight up destroy artifacts, turn any creature into an artifact and then boop. <laughs> like, I just, I think that those are so perfect for it. And, and that's in addition to the just amazing amount of things you can do with Liquid Metal, Liquid Metal Torque. So, yeah, uh, should definitely see more play in that commander. Absolutely, definitely. Okay, Dana, now we're getting back into our main topic, because you had a question for me that uh, I turned into a challenge to that segue instead. Yes. Uh, but you were asking me about uh, surprises, if there were decks, uh, their win rates uh, surprised me at all. And um, definitely Barakos surprised me, uh, 38 win percent on that one. I was like, okay, because I thought it was kind of janky, but it turns out I, I think I'm actually good at this whole party strategy, uh, apparently. So that's that's neat to see. Um the amount of pre-cons games that I won, that initially was kind of like, whoa, that one also threw me because that was also at 38%. Until I remembered that most of the games that I played against, uh, that I played with pre-cons were against other pre-cons. And the pre-con that I played the most often was the villains deck against other Doctor Who decks. And um, let's just say that the, the balance of those decks was very in favor of the villains deck, in my opinion. Uh, I think the deck was doing a lot more work there than necessarily I was. Um, but yeah, th those numbers certainly uh, felt kind of interesting. Um, and I guess if I had to label another, uh, my Commander Commander deck, that one surprised me too, because uh, that's the one that has the biggest theme restriction. And as a result of that, the mana base is terrible by following <laughs> that theme restriction. It's a, it's a four color deck playing 35 basic lands, and it only has like two color fixer or ramp cards in the, in the entire deck. But that deck was smack dab on my win percentage of the year. It won one third of its games. And, and also, we haven't gotten to the game length data yet, but the speed at which that deck could win a game also surprised me this year as well. And I think it's probably just important for me to remember that, you know, even if it does have a theme restriction, Tana and Timna are still Tana and Timna. Sure. Um, and, and I guess I also, uh, I'll mention that uh, my Conrad deck really took me for a ride this year too. Because um, for like the first nine months, it didn't win a single game the whole year. Because I think people see Conrad and they're like, all right, I'm going to make sure that I can't do anything. And rightly so. But then without me even changing the deck all that much in the past, Past, uh, three months at the very end of the year it finally got a bunch of wins and it swung way up the win percentage finally spiked up so um that deck was definitely a bit of a roller coaster this year so definitely some surprises on my end with all of those how about you i would say the the one that surprised me most was my dromoka the eternal deck that wound up with my second highest win percentage and it was at 60 percent huh. um for a selesnia dragons deck okay uh, that one definitely shocked me um I, I would guess it's probably a, something that people just don't take seriously because it's a Celestia Dragons deck. And aside from, you know, the occasional old gnawbones, the um, the dragons I have to run to have enough playable bodies in that deck <laughs> are fairly embarrassing. Um, there's some, some, some real medium cards to actually have a playable dragon in that deck. But 
because of the way Dramolka works with bolster, um, you know, puts plus one counters on things. And it just so happens that like Selesnia has a ton of plus one counter synergy. Um, it, it just winds up being a deck that like I kind of built because I thought Selesnia dragons would be funny. And it, it's really easy to all of a sudden put like 16 counters on this flying dragon. That's by default, a, you know, five, five or six, six or something and just dome somebody. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, like, but but I was still surprised that it was, that it won that many games. I, I would say it's a combination of the deck functions better than it looks like it would, and people don't really take it seriously when they see it. Well, I, I think that's also like almost a misnomer saying it's a Selesnia Dragons deck because that's straight up like a plus one counter double double double. <laughs> like for, for the most part, yeah, it winds up how it plays. Yeah, and, and uh, again, a lot of the dragons in Selesnia colors have plus one counter sub themes. Right. So not only does a deck do that and the commander does it, but like. There's multiple dragons in the deck that care about counters as well. A Sunscorch Regent, for example, cares about counters. We we actually got the Guardian Scale Lord fairly recently, which is a really actually oh, good yeah. dragon, kind of a Sun Titan effect. And just coincidentally enough, also has some plus one counter synergy. So it's a deck that like absolutely just, co- you know, through no pre-planning of my own wound up being very synergistic. Yeah, I think one of the things here that I'm noticing about that example for your Dramoka stuff and the unexpectedness of it, I think that that unexpected quality has a lot to do with the, the the decks that did well for us this year, as opposed to a deck that like the win condition is maybe more gradual and that people can see coming and therefore prepare for it. That is one of the things that I'm noticing is a very big commonality throughout the decks that were doing well versus maybe not necessarily doing well and how like telegraphed those strategies were in advance and how surprising some of those things were, such as using the dragons and then surprise, here's a plus one counter double spell that will make this a very lethal commander instead um and and speaking of game endings i think now that moves us to a thing that i tracked this year but which you didn't and i I, i'm excited to talk about and that's game length uh so because i'm a crazy person i tracked the uh the length of the games that i played this year and dana it was kind of some interesting numbers do you i'll throw this question to you first do you have an estimation of how long your games were uh on average this year or is that not even a figure that you've got in your head i I would like to keep track of it next year because i'm i am genuinely curious i I would dare say my games were closer to 10 turns than they were to seven for example okay um and the one game i can think of that went kind of quickly um was I remember specifically because when we were doing the rule zero conversation with my Agnes deck, I mentioned how, you know, yeah, it's, it's kind of aggro but I'm not running much, any fast man or anything. And I like, there's almost no way I could win before turn seven. Um, and I won on turn seven hmm. and in the, the, one of the people I killed, you know, made a come. Oh, I thought your deck couldn't win before turn seven. I was like, man, you're playing a reanimator deck, and I just cast insurrection and took all the stuff that you cheated into play. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry that I won on exactly the turn I said was the fastest I could go, but like you enabled that. So I, it, it, I doubt there were many other games where I closed something out before seven. Most of my games were in the eight to, you know, eleven or twelve range. Okay, so my expectation was also like, oh, maybe 10 turns on average. Um, And going over uh, all all of these figures, the average game length wound up being 9.4 turns uh, for how long the game went. Note that I'm only tracking from the beginning of my own turns here. I'm not tracking from the beginning of each round. That can certainly bias the way that we want to read that data. If you want to round it down to nine, that totally makes a lot of sense to me. But yeah, on average, games lasted about nine turns. Um, My longest game of the year was a 20 turn game against a Tasha deck that had a, a lot to say about controlling the board. Um, and I did play about three games this year that were uh, five turns long um, and they all ended in combos, of course. Uh, sure. Things that are going to make everyone die very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, the nine, I was like, all right, you know, 9.4. I'm, I'm feeling like interesting about that one. Um, but another th- figure that I started tracking a little bit later into the year, a couple of months into the year, um, was the average first KO. And like, how big was the gulf between when the first player gets knocked out and when the game ends? Because that's the thing that I'm distressed about. If I like have a deck that like, oh yeah, the game ends on turn 10, but I actually knock someone out on turn six and then they're just sitting there for half an hour. That's the thing I feel pretty guilty about. Um, and so I don't want to represent a deck as like a 10 turn deck if it's actually like able to knock someone out on, you know, turn six or whatever. Um, but I wanted to see what is the gulf between like when someone gets knocked out and when the game actually ends. And the average first turn, uh, the average first KO was turn 8.1, according to the data that I tracked. That was usually the first turn that one or more persons was knocked out of the game. Um, 
And in case people are interested, uh, there were 116 games that I played where the first death was on a different turn than when the game ended, which means that there were 101 games that I played where everyone died at exactly the same time. Uh, so yeah, throwing a whole bunch of numbers at you there, but Dana, would that line up with your expectations of the average game length of 9.4 turns? That that feels about right. Um, I, I would say most people probably slightly underestimate how fast, how, how many turns or games went. If they say, you know, if they guess 10, it's probably closer to nine. Yeah. Um, because those last turns tend to take a lot longer. So you feel like the, if you extrapolate out those first four turns, you assume that you've gone, you know, three times as many when the game goes three times as long as those first four turns take. And it doesn't really break down that way. So that sounds about right. And I would guess mine. If uh, Next year when I track them, I would not be surprised to see something in the in a very similar range. Genuinely, Dana, I, I, because like I'm co signing with your read there that like people might like estimate a certain number and it's actually faster than that. If you're predicting there, I wouldn't be surprised if you end up in like an eight point whatever turns there. Um, just, just like kind of curious, especially given your good win percentage. And I played against some of your decks and I know what that Ishtaki can do. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's like slightly under that nine figure because I, I do think that we do have that. Oh, I expect it goes about here, but it ends up being more efficient than even we realize because we, because who tracks this? Only crazy people like me, right? So, yeah. I, I definitely think anecdotally, I see. I mean, this is just in the last few years in general, less situations where like somebody gets knocked out and everyone sits there waiting. Um, Mm. I think number one, players are a little more conscious of building in ways that don't do that. I definitely am. I I, I definitely keep an eye on my decks and make sure I'm um, not knocking somebody out and then unable to finish the board off. Yeah, Uh, That was one of the things like Rafik decks way back in the day were known for was like taking out somebody with one shot and then everyone else being able to stop your Rafik deck. Um, I have a couple different Voltron decks and I'm always very conscious that like, okay, if I get to the point where I'm taking somebody out, do I have ways to ensure I can continue to do that and like take someone out the next turn and the following turn and be done? Yeah. Um, And I think generally speaking, most people either consciously or unconsciously also through that way because I remember in the early days of playing commander I saw a lot more situations where pods sat there at three players with one person just looking at their phone in a way that doesn't happen quite as much today I feel like yeah I mean that's literally why I took my old graven deck apart because I would thunder one person down and then wouldn't necessarily have the uh momentum to be able to like have that continue throughout the rest of the game and then one person would be sitting there for an extra long time and i was like i just i feel so bad about that play pattern um so when i was applying those metrics between like you know the distance between the first ko and the end of the game for my individual decks predictably the one that wins with commander damage the most often my mimeoplasm deck it had an average ko on turn 7.3 even though the games on average went 9.5 turns uh so even if it's not my fastest deck overall that's the thing that i want to be aware of when i say oh yeah uh, let me play this i could say oh it's a 9.5 turns or whatever but like I, I would more likely say it can knock someone out on turn seven because that is more accurate um to, to the way that that deck, that deck plays compared to my conrad deck where the first ko was on average turn 7.3 and the game end was turn 7.8 <laughs> like conrad does a lot of damage to everyone at the same time and so it's going to be a a very different figure there um right and i guess also an interesting thing here to note is that uh the other biggest gulf that i had uh, was when playing precons <laughs> the the average first ko was turn 8.4 but the game ended on 10 uh turn 10.7 um and that was one in, in a pod full of precons right and like the precons I'm, I'm not gonna worry too much about that someone else built those decks um and the the way that they're powered and balanced against each other is going to be a little bit different and a little bit less in our control but that was another interesting thing that i just wanted to throw out there and that i think it's important to pay attention to to make sure that you're creating the game experience that you're really after Mm -hmm. i also tracked my fastest and slowest decks of the year um the fastest decks were not that surprising titania uh had an average game length of 7.3 turns granted again there were only three games for that sample size uh so you know that is a thing to note conrad had a game length of 7.8 turns and then the next uh fastest decks among mine were Rayhan and Ishai, and a brand new deck that I've just made. I've only played about six games with it, though, which is Sarah and the Sixth Doctor. That's Sarah Jane Smith. Uh, it is a bunch of clues, making a whole bunch of clues. And those decks have uh, clocked in so far at 8.3 turns. But I only got six games with Sarah and the Sixth Doctor and eight games with Rayhan and Ishai. So a couple more games may switch that uh, figure up a little bit. But yeah, those are my fastest decks. And note, that is just the game length of any games that I played with those decks, not just games that they won or games that they lost. 
Um, so, you know, that is a thing to keep in mind. And then for my slowest decks, uh, these were also very predictable. Elegith, my Scry Sphinx. I only played one game with it, but it's a slow deck, and that's why I don't play it. <laughs> and that went to turn 11. Um, I don't think if I played a whole bunch more games with it that the games would end much sooner than that, especially not the games that the, that deck wins. Um, the next lowest were pre-con decks against each other. A pre-con environment, the games on average were 10.7 turns, and right behind that was my Will Help deck, where the games were also 10.6 turns. Um, which, uh, yeah, kind of tracks. Zombies, they're, they're, they're slow. They're slow. But yeah, those were my fastest and slowest decks. Again, the sample size on these as we start to go into just little bits of the individual deck data is certainly not a lot. A couple more games could swing a whole lot of these figures, but they are interesting to look at here. So one of the things I know you tracked this year was was fast mana in your decks. Was there was there or or just in your games in general? Yeah. Is there any statistics about that that kind of jumped out at you? Yeah, this is the big one. <laughs> this is the folks who clicked away from the YouTube really early. They're missing out on the really juicy thing here. I think um, this is this is probably the stat that I'm most worried about saying out loud. If I'm being perfectly honest, because I don't want like listeners. Listen responsibly. Viewers, view responsibly, okay? We are not saying that this is true for everyone. This is one person's sure. experience, okay? This is just me, and I am across a vast ecosystem of Commander stuff. So don't go saying, well, according to EDH Rec, fast mana affects games in this way, yada, yada, this much percent of the time. No, it's just, it's just one, one guy. Just one guy over one year. So, like, let's be responsible with this. But yes, of the 37 games that I saw fast mana present, which is to say like a soul ring on turn one, a mana crypt on turn one, or jeweled lotus on turn one, like that kind of thing. When fast mana was present on turn one, 17 of those games were won by the person who deployed that fast mana. So doing the math on that, that is a 45.9% win percentage for the person who got fast mana out on turn one. Um, and that's more than the 25% we would expect, right? So that seems like a thing. Like, okay, that's interesting. Again, though, I only saw Fast Mana on turn one 37 games out of the 200 whatever that I played. So, like, the sample size is small. If th There are things called p-values that I have not been able to, like, I haven't been able to disprove the opposite of this. Like, st stats are complicated. Please don't take this as gospel. Like, please don't. But in my experience, yeah, Fast Mana had a pretty darn big impact over the course of the year. And I think that that is a... Uh, uh, that, that's just I'm going to say it out loud and I'm going to ask you again to listen responsibly <laughs> yeah th th this is a, a it's a, this is a data point that doesn't contain um a, ho a whole bunch of other data points that impact it yes yeah you know like was anyone else in those pods running fast mana like if everyone is on an equal page and everyone has a crypt and a vault and something else and a jeweled lotus in their deck then that's also going to like equalize those things so like is this a matter of like, to, to talk about hard power that i mentioned earlier is this a, a situation where like hard power in, in this person had a bunch of fast mana options and and that is what helped them win or is this a situation where they just drew the one fast mana piece they had and they drew it at the perfect time and that happened to help them push push them over the top like there's so many variables here very much and i i think a common thing uh throughout the the commander sphere out there especially folks online a lot of folks may expect that maybe fast mana would like draw so much attention to you that it could even decrease your win percentage. But like, I, this isn't a thing that I feel comfortable saying, oh, it's definitely this one way because the sample sizes in all of those directions are just like not enough. And like socially what matters is whether you're having a good game. Mm -hmm. So like if it does cause you to be targeted and therefore you're like sandbagging, you're going to deploy it. That is totally a valid strategy for some of those fast mana pieces. But there, it could also be the case that like, you know, I think I'll be able to get stuff done way faster than anyone else if I do get this fast mana out right here. And I certainly think that I played against some players who had that mindset and who were able to execute on it pretty darn well. This isn't a shocking figure to me. I hope that people don't take it out of context. This is, again, just one dude. <laughs> just one dude sharing an experience, and it is not a commentary on a thing for all commander uh, players out there. That would be the dangerous thing, is, is applying this data to everyone out there so uh, you know let's just let's just make sure that we we are sensible about what this data really means and it was just one person's experience observationally good cards tend to be good yeah, I, I like that yeah yeah <laughs> i think that's a very good way to say it so another thing that i tracked this year was also how often the first 
person to go in turn order how often they won the game and this was something very interesting like when i was doing this project a lot of the questions that i got from people when they saw me logging in my notebook or anything like that they saw me updating my spreadsheet or when i just like mentioned the project and they started asking questions but a lot of people asked about how often does the first player win the game because i guess there was kind of this expectation that it would have a really big impact on a player's win percentage um, that you would win above the average expected 25 percent of the time that wasn't necessarily the case for me. Of the 217 games that I played, 58 times out of those uh, times where the player was going first, they won that game. So that's to say that the person who went first won 26.7% of the time, which feels like right in the average to me. It doesn't feel like, oh, that's a notable, like, yeah, it's kind of just fitting right there. So, you know, assuming that in a four player game, everyone has a 25% chance of winning, there wasn't a big impact to the player one wins. Um, I didn't track things like, did the person who went last lose a lot? Because that was too much to track even for me. Um, but like, yeah, I just thought that that was also uh, a, a thing to kind of note is that I didn't see a big difference depending on who went first, at least in the games that I happened to play. Yeah, I also would have assumed there would be some kind of a difference there. Um, but I would have assumed that just because I, I would have assumed that, I guess I've never, uh, I've never observed any kind of real advantage to going first there clearly is one, but like, I wonder if that's one of those things where <laughs> intangibly people just balance that out without even really like realizing they're doing it. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I don't have a definitive thing here. I yeah. think that it's certainly going to be the case that like, were we playing more competitively, this might be something that we can measure certainly. Um, a bigger, bigger impact. Um, that's probably where the benefit of going first might be felt the, the most as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the games that I played weren't quite uh, at that gear, maybe. Um, so yeah, like but if, just in my experience, I didn't see it. If you're playing really, really fast magic and the games are going five turns, there's a much larger advantage to being the one who goes first than you are if games are going, you know, 9.6 or whatever it, it was that your games went. Yeah, H having more turns is good. Who knew? Uh, but, right. you yeah. know, when when you are you know, kicking it laid back again, a, a, a couple of the games that I played against my, were, were against my family this year. You know, it's just like we, were, we weren't taking it super seriously. Sure. Um, so that's just a, a, a thing to note. And one other thing that I wanted to, to kind of mention here. And then, man, I, I tracked a lot of stuff here, Dana. Um, <laughs> there's another thing that I wanted to get into here as well. It was the last thing that I put together. Um, it was how games ended. Uh, and this one, I'm also, I, I think, I think it's very fascinating. Um, like did a game end from combat from like, you know, a crater of behemoth, or did it win from a combo? you got your exquisite blood and sanguine bond, infinite combo or things like that. Um, you know, was it a bunch of blood artists <laughs> that, that won a game, uh, before I reveal my numbers though, I guess I'm kind of curious if you have expectations for what the breakdown would be on like how many games ended from mill or infect or, uh, blood artist pings or things like that. Or, uh, what do you think? I mean, so so I I can uh, based on myself, um, you know, of the games I won, very few, if any, were via combo. Um, I have some infect stuff, so occasionally I probably like worked out some infect. Um, you know, the other night I killed an entire table um, with Vorpal Sword, so like I'm sure I, I had a few weird like wins like that over the course of the of the year. Mm. Um, not super, not jealous by the way. I've been trying to get a Vorpal Sword win for ages, so I'm mad that you've got one, but I don't. But anyway, go on, go on. <laughs> Um, I, I definitely lost a few games to combo, but like not an overwhelming amount. Um, you know, whenever I read like people complaining on Reddit about, you know, I went to this LGS and everyone was comboing out in turn four. I, it's just not something I run into very frequently, whether I'm playing at a event or, you know, if I'm sometimes traveling for work, I'll stop at an LGS. I just don't run into that much combo. I definitely lost to a few combo games, but it, it would, it was a very small percentage of games I saw end. Yeah, honestly, same. Uh, I only saw 10 games end due to a combo uh, this year. Um, and I should note real quick before I get into these exact numbers is that I'm only tracking the final death of the game, the way that the game actually came to a close. Um, so this doesn't represent all of the ways that players were knocked out, just the way that the last death happened in a game. So yeah, combo was only 10 times, although in that case, everyone would have uh, been ended at the same time because that tends to be how infinite combos go. Yeah. Um, but the 
most significant thing was definitely just a straight up combat effect of you know some a whole bunch of tokens or a big pump or something like that. 116 of the games that I played ended due to combat, so uh, you know pretty pretty high. And I think to me that informs a lot of like why I value things like fogs <laughs> because a whole bunch of games were ended due to just straight up combat steps. Uh, so that's why I'm putting even more emphasis on a lot of uh, prevent all combat damage effects in my decks lately. Um, and the next highest was from you know blood artist perforos those types of things that are dealing non-combat ways of making your opponents lose life uh, 66 games were one with those types of effects and then the rest were all very very low commander damage wins won 14 total games of the 217 i played i saw six alternate win condition effects here uh one that i was particularly proud of was strixhaven stadium really enjoyed knocking people out with that one i, I liked that a lot um only four games saw infect winning a game that way uh, and there, this was actually kind of interesting, too, because there were some games that I played where, in fact, if it had just been regular damage, I, it also still would have killed <laughs> the person sure, that right. I knocked out, too. Um, there was one that was an infect win, but it was also a simultaneously a commander damage win at the same time. So I was like, what do I count this? I counted it as infect. But like, yeah, lower, I think, than I expected it to be was infect. And then the saddest one, the saddest one was mill. The status one was mill. I didn't see any games end due to mill. Again, you know, I was only tracking, like, this is just seeing the final death of the game. I have seen some people get milled out this year, but not win that way, uh, win the entire game that way. So, mill, I'm very sorry about it. I'm very, very sorry. But I didn't, I didn't see you win a game this year. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I saw a, a mill win or even a mill death this year. Might have happened, but if it did, I don't remember it. And if I did, it was that one time that I've since forgotten. It definitely is not a common thing. And I think also my numbers are kind of skewed on the life loss stuff. Like, yeah, a life loss, it'll track just if anyone's playing a Torment of Hellfire, but... Like, we all know me, I have a Conrad deck, I have Babala Saga, they are draining life. So, like, the number of wins that were the result of, like, life loss or those types of, like, pings and damage effects, I think that my own, like, predilections for which decks I play had a lot to do with, with like, affecting those numbers. Um, so, the vast majority of things that I saw, games ended due to, like, a straight up, here's a big combat swing. Um, and that's one final lesson that I thought might be kind of interesting for people to take away. Well, well, Joey, what decks did you see most across the table from you? Ooh, interesting question. Um, hard to answer. Uh, I, I played against 375 unique commanders this year, which is a lot. Um, the decks that I played against the most were definitely ones in my family. I tracked, uh, like, oh sure. In my family, there's a real surreal initiative deck, and we've got like, I, I, we've printed out a, a play mat for people to like move their stuff through the dungeon, which is really really fun. Um, there's also my mom's Arrington Giada flying deck. Nine games uh, against that. Ten were against the real surreal. Um, there's a, a Kyler deck in my family meta, and Matt has a Kyler deck, so I played against Kyler eight times this year. But I don't want to count those because like they weren't all technically different people. So the decks that aren't in my normal meta that I played against the most, where it was the greatest number of times that I saw it from different people, was actually Halana and Elena Partners, which I played against six times this year. Oh, the gruel, uh, interesting folks that are putting the plus one counters on all of the things. Um, so I, yeah, cool. That, I was happy to see that. I was surprised by it. I think a close runner up was um, Queen Marchesa and the new Alila. I think those were the, the two runners up for that. I think it was like five games on, on each of those. Um, but but yeah, that was a, a, an interesting thing was Halana and Elena. I saw the most diversely, but also I played against my family a lot. So <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I saw some very specific ones a whole lot of times, but I saw uh, those, oh my God, they were roommates uh, folks <laughs> uh, six total times. We're from different people. Um, I, I ran into um, Lathril Blade of Elves uh, nine different times. Oh. Um, and it was probably, I don't really, I don't know anyone with a Lathril deck, so I'm going to guess it was probably even nine different people. Um, same thing with Miriam Sentinel Worm, six different games with Miriam. <laughs> um, and, and after that, it was Wilhelt. Five Wilhelt games was was the number three, and I, I would bet at least one of those was yours. So if like, be, yeah. I were to disregard that, it, it would be f four games, and it would be down with multiple other commanders I saw four times. So I did not see a ton of overlap this year. I, I also, like, it's, uh, hi, Miram. Hi, Lathril. Nice to see you. Super ridiculously popular commanders. Yeah. Um, I have, weirdly, I didn't encounter a whole lot of them in my own data this year. I expected them to be near the top. Um, but I did just recently draft Baldur's Gate again, and I opened Miram in my first pack and then made a ridiculous Miram deck in that limited. 
it doesn't care if it's limited. Miriam's ridiculous. Like th that, I had. I get the appeal now because I copied my dragons too. Um, we played one very quick game where I Miriamed the whole table, and then we played another game where uh, I was definitely arch enemy from turn one, and even then I still nearly got there. <laughs> um, yeah, Miriam's ridiculous. So I'm sorry for your your uh, Miriam experiences, Dan. <laughs> when I drafted Miriam, I did the same thing. I drafted Miriam in the in the Baldur's Gate draft um, at at the event in Richmond. Uh -huh. um, when the set came out and that was the event where we had a um a, a problem with flights that night and matt and i wound up driving all night long to get to the event <laughs> I so this. i drafted a miriam deck on like 40 minutes of sleep yeah and and won both of my pods because miriam's just busted so like <laughs> uh, yes even even in that draft environment with me barely functional i i was able to win a couple pods so yeah that is a real really really strong commander yeah it, it kind of gave me that experience of like oh no oh, oh no <laughs> like i <Yeah>. just <laughs> now that i've felt the power surging through me oh no what am i going to do <laughs> Uh, I, I, I can't possibly. I'd be going down the dark side if I were to uh, continue down that. But I do have a mirror in my collection now. I'm just like staring at it. <laughs> I, I will throw one thing I want to mention um, about win percentage too. Um, this was something that yeah. that a, a player said the other day, um, a week or two ago, when I was playing with some people at my shop, and it was I think my Esperia Supreme Judge deck, and I had um, I had Esperia out and. A player to my, I think it was my left, it was like, oh, I just, I, we need to deal with that Asperia. I've played this deck before and this is, this situation is going to be a problem. Um, hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm going to sort of supply shares out of Traxa. Um, huh. Like, even, even, even being aware that Miriam, that, that, uh, that Asperia deck was a problem, Atraxa is a bigger problem. Like, it, and I think that is something that it, it impacts my win percentage. Hmm. Um, that Dramoka deck, there's 200 Dramoka decks in EDA track. Right, yeah, yeah. It, it, and, I, and I have one of them on Architect and one of them on Moxfield, so like 1% <laughs> of those decks are me. <laughs> like literally. <laughs> Dana is the 1%. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so, so even the, the, the decks that are good, sometimes like if there's a Miriam in play, even if like, you know my deck is good, there's... There's a chance it's not going to perform because it's Dramoka. You know Miriam's going to perform. So, like, I, I think that also helps me a ton. Hmm. Almost all of my commanders are, while good, are ones that tend to not be nearly as scary as something like Miriam. And even players that are aware that they're powerful still find themselves like, I just can't rationalize removing Asperia Supreme Judge when, you know... Atraxa or Miriam or or whomever is is there in play. Um, I, I think there's a lot to be said for playing commanders that fly under the radar. I like that too. And also another thing that I was kind of interested in, and, and I'll go deeper into some of these uh, stats probably on my own time. It's going to be too much for us to get into here. But like, I, I'm not just curious about like, oh, which of my decks won or, or lost the most, but like, because I was talking with um, the folks from Architect uh, in, about this project while I was like setting everything up. Um, and their observation I, I really liked was it doesn't really matter how much your deck is losing so much as like what your deck is losing too. Mm -hmm. That is a, a more important thing for you to take away is like, what are the environments that this thing is losing against? Because like, yeah, your Will Hut deck is definitely going to lose a lot if you're regularly r running it against people who pack a whole lot of graveyard hate or, or things like that, or just commanders that are more likely to have those rest in pieces present and stuff like that. Sure. Um, so like, yeah, being aware of like stuff that flies under the radar, but then also being aware, not just like, oh, is this deck losing a lot or oh, is this deck winning a lot? But like, what is it apparently best against? And what are the things that you would actually have the most weaknesses against? Because those could be totally different. It's very, very possible. Like, first of all, it's possible that there's human error in the data that I've been tracking over this sure, year. Right. I am yes, but a fallible sure. human with a, f a dumb human flesh brain. But also it's uh, possible that like I've had better luck with certain commanders simply because of where and who I played them against. Mm -hmm. And I had bad luck with certain commanders because of where and who I played them against. Um, and that for me, kind of going back to some of the stuff at the, at the top is like, if I do have a deck that I feel like is punching too hard, then I want to make sure that like I am better about playing this deck in different areas. Like my Vohar deck, for instance, that was one that I was just pulling out against just anybody. 
but it's one near on half of its games this year. And I'm like, I, I, I need to be more selective about where I'm actually playing this. Sure. So the under the radarness, the <laughs> radarness, that's a word now. Um, and the, <laughs> the places that you're playing those, like yeah. all of those go into uh, making sure that you're fostering a, a good game for everyone and that you're not even accidentally misrepresenting something because certainly decks can surprise you because <laughs> plenty of them surprised me this year. Yeah, I definitely, think there's a big difference between like winning a high percentage of games that are a scratch app where like Mm -hmm. everything goes back and forth and because of you know a combination of your experience and maybe your commander being unassuming and the the little tiny advantages you've baked in that aren't readily apparent in your deck and like you manage to like pull out that victory on turn 10 i think having a high win percentage in that environment is a much different thing than having a high win percentage when you absolutely dominate a game and win on turn six or seven Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that's very much the case. Um, I'm a little bit worried now since I've said the like oh a whole bunch of the games that I played this year were against my family. I, I expect folks to be like oh well yeah your win percentage has, is high because you're just like just crushing your family with stuff. No, no, it's not. Uh, honestly, the decks that I play against them are not going to... I don't play Conrad against my mom. I'm just not going to do that. And frankly, if I were to track her win percentage, I think it'd be huge. Like, <laughs> she wins a lot of her games. Uh, so uh, that is also a thing to just you know be aware of. I'll, I'll try and break some of these things down, like I was saying, um, you know, on a more per deck basis, but like specifically just the games that this one lost. We're looking at the data of just the ones that this one won, but also like trying to track where it won. But that's... That sounds like a much bigger uh, project uh, that I don't know if I'll be able to fully stomach at this present moment, because already this was a whole lot. But dang, was it fun. Yeah, I just like that in my head, you just coined the term fam stomping versus uh, pub stomping. It's not what uh, it was. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Fam stomping. I don't like that. No. Mom mom stomping when your mom comes in and just wrecks everyone in the the house with her OP deck. that, That would be mom stomping. Fr- frankly, her Arrington Giada deck is awesome. And also that Rilsa Rail initiative deck that our family has. Also, that deck is maybe 50 bucks and it wins a lot of games. Uh, seriously, I'll, I'll, I will need to track this from my family and be like, hey, you're, you're winning his decks. Um, they won't be surprised. They'll be like, yeah, we mom stopped you. Um, right, there we go. Right. <laughs> but, but Dana, I have one other confession, I guess, that I, I want to make here. Like over the course of this, this was such a slog to like to get into the habits of yeah. like, how to track these things and to remember to track the turn moving it like i've usually put like a die on top of my deck and then i'd forget sometimes and like getting into that habit holy crap that was a lot of work a work that i can't recommend to anybody but at the end of it i'm so entertained by this that dana i think i'm gonna have to do it again for this coming year i think i'm gonna have to do it again man i am too <laughs> yeah yeah i am too i i've, I've already played my first three games of the year and i've already recorded the it's the third it's january 3rd at time of recording you've already you are fast you're very fast at this uh i actually I, i'm gonna try to do a game a year this year on average i'm gonna see if i can if i can pull it up. and and i'm gonna try to catch up but i had a hundred <laughs> less decks plus than, than than you so like we'll uh we'll see whether those things average out to each other um but yeah this this has absolutely been fascinating and i think the only last note that maybe i'll, I'll want to leave here is just like listeners be aware if you decide to take on some type of project like this be aware of some type of observer effect Mm -hmm. because it's possible that when you are paying attention, like once you start scrutinizing your own stuff like this more, it'll make you care about it more, even if you say you don't care about it. And I noticed that happening to me too over the course of the year. Is that like I started to be like, oh, well, this Conrad hasn't won anything all year. What's going on? And I had like an emotional attachment to it. And I had to like divorce myself from that feeling to be like, don't play it differently. Just try and get some actual stuff. So maybe a thing that I you know would want to do is just like collect all of it and not actually like measure any of the information until the very end of the year um because you know the paying attention to a thing can change how you feel about that thing and so that's one final thing that i want to put as a lesson out there if you do track and you see that you know a deck isn't winning a whole lot that doesn't matter what matters is whether you're having fun with it so make sure that you're prioritizing the right thing that's my final thing that i want to say about this whole project i didn't do that but as i was tallying up the data um the the one deck that jumped out at me was my, my silm guard deck that did wind up at the end of the year winning uh, about a quarter of its games i think lost the first seven or eight or so i played with it mm-hmm. um and i don't remember that so like i, I clearly hadn't looked at the stats but then i remember thinking I, as i'm tallying it up i'm thinking had I noticed that at the time, I wonder if I would have kind of reacted and like this deck's 0 and 8. I need to do some kind of a, a, an overhaul. And clearly, end of the year, it wound up winning a quarter of its game, so I didn't need to do that. But I did. I never found myself in that position, and I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I just let it ride and didn't check on those stats. Yeah. So 
Oh, Dana, this was a lot. I've, I've been so excited to do this episode and I'm glad that we finally got to it. This is, this is a, a really, really fun. Maybe one. next year we can get Matt to track some stats and he inside out with us to do the same thing. You know, it's not going to happen. The, the, there's a reason that his favorite commanders are like Kyler and Raga Draga. He just wants to play big creature, go smash. I'm like, yes. He, yeah. There's no way that he's going to be like, oh, yeah, let's do the studious Azorius sort of thing of tracking all S- of it. Celestia players doing math? <laughs> not in my magic. Math is for blockers. Math is for, for us tracking our games, but yeah. not for him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and in case we didn't say it before, I'm going to have a link to uh, my spreadsheet in the show notes for this episode. Uh, Dana, we're not sure if you'll have one there. Um, and we'll try and have like a rubric. Uh, we're going to figure out how to do a rubric for like you know making your own if you want to copy uh, what i've done but i'm not sure how to do that just yet so like g- g- give it time i'm sorry we're figuring out this is a whole lot uh, to go through again i am exhausted having tracked 217 games over the year but i'm gonna do it again and i'm excited to see the results next year yeah <laughs> okay Dana, I think with that, we're calling this episode to a close, aren't we? Yeah, uh, you can find me online at Dana Roach, and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash edhreccast and at YouTube slash edhreccast. <laughs> Presumably where they're watching us right now. Right now, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz online. Most likely I'm being a fool on Instagram or something like that. And you can find the cast at edhretcast everywhere online. And if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at edhretcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for their fantastic work in the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Mm-hmm.